Okay. Um, I guess we'll uh, go ahead and try to get started pretty close to on time. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for uh, coming to today's Codex Lunchtime Talk. Uh, we're the lunchtime talk on smart legal contracts and legal smart contracts, so thank you for choosing this one. <laughs> um, normally, you'd see Roland Vogel, who's our Codex Executive Director, up at the podium. Um, Roland got called out of town on another commitment, um, so I'm thrilled to fill in. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, do the introductions today. I guess starting with me, um, I'm a residential fellow here at Codex. My name is Susan Salkine, and I'm delighted to introduce our uh, first and primary speaker, Meng Wang Wang, uh, who is uh, going to um, give us a survey of the history of digital contracts and update us on some recent developments. Uh, to help us sort out the players in this very busy and crowded field. Uh, so Meng uh, is an entrepreneur, investor, and technologist specializing in deep tech, uh, internet infrastructure, and open source startups. Uh, in 1995, he co-founded PoBox.com, uh, an early uh, commercial email service, and in the 2000s, he uh, led the development and global adoption of the SPF email standard as well as uh, co-founded a, uh, co a venture-funded big data startup, which was later sold to FICO. In Singapore, Meng uh, co-founded Hackerspace.sg and JFDI.asia, uh, which pioneered startup acceleration in the region. Uh, Meng has invested in over 70 startups and has held fellowships, including most recently at Harvard Ber Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and Meng would like us to know that he programs in Perl, JavaScript, Prolog, and Haskell. Uh, Meng's talk will be followed by a quick update on the new uh, Codex blockchain group, so we're uh, looking forward to hearing more about that later. So I'll turn it over to Meng. Well, thank you, Susan. All right. Um, yeah. So just to get a sense of who's in the audience, can I ask who here is a lawyer or a law student or legal track? Okay. And who here is a, an engineer or a programmer or a scientist? Huh, okay, so that's good. Is anybody both a lawyer and a programmer? Yes. Interested in electronic contracts in business as an entrepreneur, okay. Is there anything else that somebody wants to particularly hear about or talk about today? Um, is there, do you wanna? Well, you, Okay, product manager for legal tech company. Do a lot of contracts. And you, sir, is there, what's your interest here? I'm fascinated by the fact that you started Yeah, uh, okay, well that, that, was a, that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but okay, so, um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about this, this stuff today. And We'll get into some of the, uh, the implications, the business implications or the startup implications of what's going on in the space. Um, who here has heard the term smart contract in the news? Yeah? Okay. So what people usually like to say about smart contracts is that they are neither smart nor contracts. Ha ha, funny, right? But there um, recently, uh, there's been a small number of engineers who have said to this challenge accepted and why don't we make contracts both smart and actual contracts? And that has been powering a wave of change that's been happening over the last couple of years. But if you were to look at smart contracts, I think you could see it from, you could see two very different kinds of things as satisfying the definition of smart contracts. And on the one hand, there is the tradition of things like Contract Express and Hot Docs and Exari. Is there anyone here who's like a practicing lawyer who's ever come across or used one of these commercial systems? These are in the market, they've been around for 20 years and you've used them or at least you've tried them, right? <laughs> and then decided to use them or not, right? Um, there's things like LegalZoom, uh, Law Depot, Rocket Lawyer. Has anybody here been a user of those kinds of, um, sort of public legal services? Not yet, but you're thinking about it, okay. And what about things like Luminance, LogEeks, uh, Cura, LexPredict, anything that does contract analytics? Has anyone here with a law firm that's started looking at these solutions? No? All right, so this will be useful new information. Um, 
I think it's possible to classify the, these two things as smart legal contracts, where you're trying to take traditional legal contracts and make them smart. And then the new generation of blockchain enthusiasts, they're doing what they call smart contracts, and they're trying to make them legal. So the things on the left, this has to do with document assembly, the automated construction of PDFs and Word documents that you can sign. Um, LegalZoom, Law Depot, Rocket Lawyer, what they do is give the public access to contracts and forms. And uh, there's a small genre of contract analytics startups that try to say, you know, given these 2,000 contracts that are in your company Dropbox, let's analyze them and figure out which of them are about to expire soon or which of them need to be changed. So they're working on assembly, access analytics. And then, you know, about four years ago, people like Vitalik came along, they did Ethereum and Oh my God, there are a bunch of anarchists. <laughs> they don't even fit into that framework, right? So, so I'm gonna talk about both sides of this divide and see how they can come together. Um, right, and there's actually a lot more going on. Just in the last few months, a whole bunch of new initiatives have come up uh, in the space of trying to make your smart contracts on the blockchain something that will stand up in front of a judge. So the space is very big, it's very crowded, there's a lot going on. Um, I'm going to focus in on the bottom left of this map. I'm looking at document automation and I'm looking at contract management analysis. And even there, there's a couple dozen startups working on various aspects. Um, but before I get into all this, right, I think I want to talk about what I don't want to talk about, which is there's this trendy term lately called AI. And if you go over to the engineering school, they'll say, you know, we've been working on AI for 50 years now, and there's more intelligence that has ever gone into AI than has ever come out of it. Um, but, you know, it, it, there's kind of a lot of hype going on right now. People are talking about using AI in contract drafting, and this just came up on my Twitter feed yesterday. Uh, Ken Adams is somebody we'll talk about in a minute. He's the author of the Manual of Style for Contract Drafting, and when he read this article in Legal Tech News, um, he just said, you know, this is ridiculous. Machine learning and deep learning will turn base metals into gold. Machine learning and deep learning will give you immortality uh, and grant you a ticket to heaven at the same time. Um, so is a lot of hype around what deep learning can do. And people are saying, you know, why don't we just absorb every contract ever written and use deep learning to produce new contracts, which is a little bit like saying, why don't we use machine learning and deep learning to read every great work of literature that's ever been written and use that to produce new works of literature, right? Obviously, it's that simple. So that's the problem with AI today. I think we're sort of reaching peak AI hype. Uh, it is possible to go out there, download TensorFlow, and run the tutorials. And after you finish the tutorial, you start, you start a startup. And you say, I've, I'm doing a startup that is implementing this tutorial as a product. And you can get funded doing this. This is the traditional approach. In the new world, you do an ICO. Um, but anyway, this is, this is something I just want to get out of the way, right? That it's in my system. Um, let's talk about these two gentlemen. Can anyone identify these two lovely Greek men? Anyone? David on the left? Nope. They're a pair. You can, well, they're sort of like generic ancient European. So the dude over there is Apollo, and the dude over there is Dionysus, Dionysus, right? Apollo and Dionysus. Here's another painting of them. Apollo is the one, the blonde guy with the harp, and Dionysus is the drunk dude with the wine. And if Nietzsche were here, he would say, yes, this is a dichotomy that I recognize. Uh, Dionysus is sort of the right brain, emotional, probabilistic, drunk dude. And Apollo is the left brain, formalist, sort of uh, logical, reason-oriented, not so drunk dude who is looking at his brother and like, dude, why are you having so much fun? What's wrong with you? And this is exactly what's been going on in AI for the last few years. We've just got different names for this symbolic AI, 
on statistical AI, machine learning, deep learning, neural nets, SVMs, all that sort of thing. And in the last few years, statistical AI has made leaps and bounds, mostly because of these things called massively parallelizable GPUs. These are massively parallelized GPUs, and Dionysus has just been harvesting these things, and they just double in capacity every 18 months. And there's a whole bunch of things that you can do with Dionysian AI. You can do really good um, automated translation. So Google just threw out their existing traditional translation software and replaced it by something that was powered by machine learning, deep learning. But deep learning does run into some classic challenges. <laughs> right? <laughs> like this is, this is the kind of thing that stumps a deep learning engine. Um, and like it can make some serious mistakes that are just like unacceptable, right? And the reason Dionysus kind of behaves like a drunk person is because a lot of the algorithms that are used in machine learning and deep learning are basically, here's a whole bunch of input, and here's our current input, and what does the current input look like relative to the existing input, and let's not think too much about it. We're, we'll just look at what worked well enough last time. And Apollo would be appalled by this, right? Apollo says, no, you know, you have to actually be able to explain your reasoning. I mean, here we are in the law school, and we all believe in the idea that rules are there, and they should apply to people, and you should be able to understand the rules, and if you disagree, you should change the rules, but it shouldn't just be the king has decided. Now, in the current administration, I think things are maybe shifting a little bit to that direction, but you know, here we are, rule of law. At Stanford Law School, we still believe in some of this stuff. So I like to think of Apollonian AI. I call it algorithms you can argue with, as opposed to Dionysian AI, which is just a bunch of sort of magical black boxes. Now, Dionysian AI in the field of law can actually do some really useful things. Uh, this is some, this is a research uh, project that came out several years ago, and it's the usual machine learning. The data set in the front is the prediction of what the judge will decide and the data set in the rear, the binary one, is what the judge actually decided. So this is useful, right? You can, you can use this to say, oh, you know, did our algorithm get this wrong, or did the judge get it wrong? Um, there was a company called Lex Machina based on this whole idea, and they were acquired by LexisNexis, and their value prop was basically given every single IP litigation case, and given your case, we're gonna tell you that this is the judge that you wanna put your case in front of. So that's the kind of thing you can do with deep learning. Uh, you can do a lot of contract reading if you wanna do that. So uh, we maintain a website, legalese.com, where we keep track of the startups that are coming out in the legal tech space. And if you just go and search for startups that read contracts, you see about a dozen different players who all are trying to help people locate their contracts, read the contracts, parse the PDFs, figure out who are the parties, what are the obligations, simple things like what's the expiration date on this contract, and when do we need to renew it? So all of these things are great. They're Dionysian, deep learning. You can go get funded today doing a startup doing this. I am not going to talk about them today because I'm interested in the, in the Apollonian side and there's a whole history of Apollonian legal AI, and this stuff goes back 50, 60 years. If you go back to 1960, this is the vision. This has been the vision for a very long time, right? And you could read the whole history of this field as people trying to implement this vision and make it happen. Um, it even goes further back. If you go all the way back to 1679, Leibniz said, we need a mathematical algebra, a calculus by which we can reason logically about rules and obligations and so on. So the young version of him said, you know, it's gonna take five years. And the old version said, it's gonna take a lot longer than five years. Um, there have been a bunch of false starts along the way. So 1957, this was published, Symbolic Logic, a tool for drafting and interpreting legal documents. In 1986, uh, this work was done. They translated the British Nationality Act into prologue. Given this person with these parents who was born in this place at this time, 
are they a British citizen, yes or no? If they have this kind of spouse, are they a British citizen? And that tradition of work has come all the way forward to today, where at Stanford, at Codex, there is a project called Corpus Legis, where other things are now being translated into things that look a lot like Prolog. Uh, 2009, some work was done here to formalize HIPAA so that you could make it machine readable. Uh, at Codex, the contract definition language, this is another thing that formalized FERPA. And all of this was sort of anticipated in 1979 by this book that isn't even available in libraries anymore because it's so old. But this is a really interesting book. It's one of those books where every single chapter in the book has spawned its own industry in legal tech. So for example, if you look at chapter three, which talks about the Taxman project, this idea of formalizing tax law is basically turned into TurboTax. Um, What's the name of the book? It's, the name of the book is Computer Science and Law. <laughs> 1979, right? This is, this is back when computer science was not even barely a thing. Um, so, Taxman turned into TurboTax, or was the sort of spiritual ancestor of TurboTax. Modeling legal rules by computer is the sort of thing that every time you talk to a legal chatbot, you know, the chatbot has a bunch of legal rules modeled in there. Uh, the automated assembly of legal documents is what turned into things like Contract Express. And this, too, uses Prolog. So uh, 1981, this guy, Richard Susskind, did a major project at Glasgow. And he was so impressed by the work that was done there, he went on to a successful career in writing books about the kind of work that he had done and the implications for tomorrow's lawyers. Has anybody here read any of these books? Like, this is, this is your future, the future of your profession. So. If you haven't had the chance, if you're a law student, you should check this out. Uh, so that, that sort of takes us to the very first generation of document assembly solutions. If you remember mail merge, where you start out with like a spreadsheet and you fill the blanks in your, in your Word document, it's basically mail merge. These things take your document template and they fill in the names and the addresses and the parties and the money. And there's a whole industry that does exactly this. They do document generation. Um, document assembly, that's what it's called. And in the more nonprofit space, there's this thing called A2J author, where they help you fill out your forms to get access to justice. And that was the 80s, that was the 90s. That starts getting into the internet era. What does the open version of this look like? Docracy is an open collection of legal contracts. Uh, there's things like Law Depot, Legal Zoom. Um, contract standards, there are, there's a number of initiatives that say here are some public contracts and you can copy and paste and mix them up and create the kinds of documents that you want. In the open source space, Common Accord, uh, DocAssemble, this, this came out a couple of years ago. You can see more modern technologies like Python and YAML and Markdown. Uh, Common Form is fantastic. If you are actually thinking about building a system, this is, this is some infrastructure that you could look at. And so that happened, right? The internet came around, and some very deep thinkers at Stanford and elsewhere said, you know, from first principles, what are we really doing here? When we're using, when we're using mail merge to stitch things together, that's fine, but that's not quite good enough. That's not really computer science, right? That's just macros and copy and paste. How would a computer scientist think about this from first principles? They would say, a contract is kind of like a program, right? Like laws are kind of like an operating system. And surely it should be possible to bring some software engineering, some deep computer science to that problem from that point of view. And that is how the Computable Contracts Initiative was born, right here at Stanford, uh, with a paper by Harry Surden in 2012, which talked about how you can turn contracts into computer programs or computer code or computer records that you can then reason over. Um, a couple months ago, we hosted a workshop where we talked about some of the use cases and we'll be trying to make some implementations happen over the course of next year. This is a very rough 
uh, space of where we think computable contracts could be usefully applied. This is a project that's ongoing, so if you'd like to join this project, uh, get in touch, and there will be a mailing list. I think there is a mailing list, is that right, Susan? There's, there's a mailing list, right, so you can, it's gonna be an open project. So this, this strain of work, 1997, got a kick in the pants where Nick Zabo posted about the idea of smart contracts, how to formalize contracts. The idea of a formal language is gonna be something that comes up again and again, where if you have a formalism with a clearly defined set of semantics, you understand what you're really talking about in a way that everybody agrees on. Um, 1998, this guy did, I think, a PhD thesis on a language for electronic contracting. 2015, just a couple years ago, you take a contract, you turn it into this big graph of obligations and states and so on. Kind of looks like a flowchart. And I spent the last two years reading papers like these about how to formalize contracts, how to analyze them, how to push them through a computer and have the computer do the kind of work that traditionally you've needed a lawyer to do, right? So if you can start taking some of the value added work out of a lawyer's head and move it into software, that's when VCs get excited. So I'm not gonna go through all these papers, I'm just gonna give you the high points of some of the most exciting bits that I found in here. This was probably the most exciting piece of text that I read in all of these papers. When I read this, I said, aha, this is the holy grail, this is the missing link between what lawyers do and what programmers do. Because if you have basically the foundations of a programming language, that allow you to say something like, you know, P, K, X, E, N1, N2, Z, C, right? If you can program this up, what, th what this means is, I'll just, I'll just let you read it. This is what allows you to take any existing contract and formalize it into clause after clause after clause of obligation and action and deadline. And the claim here is that you can take any existing natural language contract and turn it into code by following this template, right? But you can take most reasoning and say if then else, right? Case statement, for loop, while loop. In the contract domain, this is the sort of fundamental expression. And once you have that expression, you can turn it into diagrams, this is a coffee machine. You could turn it into flowcharts, you can turn it into things like BPMN and SBVR and UML that have been floating around for a long time. And the cool thing is you can start having end users move these blobs around in the UI, in the flowchart, and then the text will change. So all of this is active work in progress. We're trying to stand on the shoulders of giants here. Um, there's a large tribe of ignored giants in the semantic web domain. Is anybody here a semantic web nerd? Yeah? Slightly shy to admit that you're a semantic web nerd, right? That's, that's why semantic web is, is like a little bit unsung. But they've done a huge amount of thinking about how to design a legal ontology. And so there's a lot of people who've been working on this thing for a very long time. Uh, it's on GitHub. There's this thing called the Legal Knowledge Interchange Framework. Um, there's an OASIS standard on e-contracts. I didn't know about this until about like three months ago. So um, there are open source projects that let you formalize rules. Here's what a formalization looks like of the Reg W uh, legal rule. It governs bank transactions and affiliated or controlled subsidiary banks. This isn't easy to write, but then neither is legislation, right? And if a legal engineer is able to write this stuff, they only have to write it once. And then the machine can do the reasoning subsequently to say, can Pacific Bank do a transaction with Maui Sunset, yes or no? And it goes off, it evaluates the rules, and it explains yes, no, and here's why. So that's useful, right? Um, question.
So the question is, how is this stuff useful? Um, is it because when you look at a potential merger, you can say, is this allowed by the regulations? Is this disallowed? You are thinking about contract generation. But I think this is, this is, contract generation is one thing, and then rule evaluation is another thing. And they're connected by the idea that there should be some formal language that allows you to express rules and express contracts and express obligations. All of these things should be expressed in a formal way so that the machines can do the reasoning. automated decision. Right, let's hold that question to the end. We'll do a little bit of Q&A and we can have a general discussion about application domains. Um, but I will note that question about like, how do you use this kind of reasoning in the context of complicated mergers and acquisitions if, right? Right, we'll talk about users and how this is actually going to meet the road uh, in the real world. This is all still fairly academic right now. So just giving you the history, right? OASIS standards, legal rule ML is a way to express some of these things, um, but you can see their heart is in the right place and they are building this stuff. This is active work today. Um, I'm gonna skip past some of these examples of how you express rules, but if you get into this, you can see that there's a lot of content there. SBVR, BPMN, um, BPEL, there's all these things. So, uh, what have I been doing? Over the last few, months, I've been spending a lot of time in this place called Europe. Europe is where a huge amount of research has been going on, completely unbeknownst to the people in this country. Uh, there have been conferences like ICAIL in London, and they've, they're onto their 16th. The International Conference on Legal Knowledge Information Systems is in its 30th year this year, so if you wanna go for this, uh, you can sign up. The registration opens this weekend. It'll happen in Luxembourg this December. There have been a whole series of workshops and conferences on formal languages and contract-oriented software. Um, in October, a couple months ago, we went for this conference on the Internet of Agreements, where the premise was, if you can have the Internet of Things, why can't we have the Internet of Agreements? And once you have the Internet of Agreements, then you enable all kinds of really useful transactions online. Um, Switzerland's been doing this. There was a Legal Tech Hackathon. Uh, in, the, in London, the Legal Geek had a conference about this, so this space is just exploding. Um, there are projects going on in legal text mining. Um, yeah, in 2000, this paper came out in how to build a domain-specific language for financial agreements, and this matured into an actual company that apparently counts many, many banks and financial institutions among its customer base. They have what's called MLFI, a modeling language for finance, in which you can describe things like derivatives and swaps and options, and the software will do the computation and tell you we should buy this thing or we should sell this thing. So this is, things that, this is the sort of thing that banks care about. Um, this is the sort of thing that governments care about. You can do reg tech. So you thought FinTech was a thing, legal tech's a thing, now reg tech is gonna be a thing, regulation as a platform. They came out of Australia and they said, we're building a platform for machine readable laws and regulations so that you can then shove it into the machine and the machine can do some thinking. So if you wanna research this, they've got a whole bunch of example projects which I couldn't fit on the screen. Um, but basically the idea is you could say regulatory reporting is something that you could automate Compliance is something that you could automate. Um, there's this company called Imandra, and they have an incredibly slick video, which I will try to share with you. What's plaguing today's electronic financial markets? The world economy is built on staggeringly complex tangle of algorithms. Competitive pressures and economic recession have contributed to increasingly opaque and unstable markets. The effects of glitches and unfair advantages cratering the confidence of investors and ultimately hurting the general public. Regulators and the industry have worked tirelessly to define what safe and fair markets are. No. What's been missing? Well, it's mostly a visual thing. All of the algorithms underlying the 
solution is formal verification, the science of correct algorithms. Other safety critical industries already rely on formal verification to make their algorithms safe. The Mondra by Aesthetic Integration is the world's first formal verification solution for financial markets. Consider the building of a great wall. A design flaw may be catastrophic. To make it safe, engineers use powerful computer-aided design tools which analyze designs for safety automatically. Powered by latest advances in artificial intelligence, computer science, and mathematics, the Mondra brings unprecedented rigor to the electronic financial markets, analyzing the safety and fairness of algorithms before their deployment. Financial algorithms are unfathomably complex. They can be in a virtually infinite number of possible states. Examining 100 1,000 or even 100,000 test cases isn't enough. We must consider every possible case to answer definitively. What can possibly go wrong? Amandra allows designers and regulators to fix breaches of safety and fairness before they affect markets. Let's build safer, more reliable, and regulatory compliance systems that all of us can trust, saving everyone time and money. Amandra, by aesthetic integration, the logic of financial risk. So this is fairly impressive stuff. Uh, it came out a year or two ago, and they are bringing formal verification techniques to financial software, which is really impressive. Uh, it's very cool. Let me move on. Um, you should go back and have a look at that video yourself if you can hear it. So this takes me to one of the, the major points of my talk, which is that one of the useful areas, like we're asking how are computer contracts useful? And one of the, the answers to that question is they can be formally verified and we can make sure that there are no mistakes in these contracts, right? That's kind of the holy grail and lawyers get paid a huge amount of money. Um, so let me explain formal verification. Is there anyone here who is familiar with formal verification, has ever done like Z3, Promella, any kind of, no? Okay, so this will be new to you. This is, this is gonna be useful. So if you go back to 1994, there was an email that came out uh, early December from Stanford talking about how when he was running some computations on a little Pentium CPU, some of these uh, appeared to be slightly buggy results. And this turned out to be what we now call the Pentium FDiv bug. Has anyone here heard of the FDiv bug? Maybe older people in the room might, might be familiar with this. Right, so the FDiv bug ended up costing Intel $475 million and it completely ruined Christmas for everybody there. And you can imagine, um, you know, this ended up on the list of the 10 most costly software errors in history, up there with spacecraft that NASA sends out and then can't talk to anymore because they've crashed because of some bug, right? And so you can imagine the conversation at Intel that happened in the new year when everybody got together and said, okay, after $475 million of recalls, how do we not do this again? And it turns out the answer to that question is, let's use formal verification to make sure that before we burn incredibly expensive silicon, we make sure that the bugs have been gotten rid of in software before we get to hardware. So there's this whole field called formal verification. The engineering school will teach it to you. There are a couple of specific elements within formal verification that I think could be incredibly useful to lawyers, and they are to do with LTL and CTL. So I'm not going to teach you LTL and CTL, I'm just gonna motivate this. Ken Adams is the, the Twitter account that I showed earlier. He's the guy who wrote the manual style for contract drafting. And the other day, earlier this year, he posted this question, Acme shall keep the information confidential versus Acme shall pay the purchase price. Right? And obviously, as a human reading this, it's obvious to you that Acme shall keep the information confidential means in general forever on an ongoing basis until the end of the contract, right? As opposed to Acme shall pay the purchase price, which is something that happens once, right? And he's having trouble with this. The guy who wrote the manual on how to write contracts is having trouble with distinguishing these two different shalls. One is ongoing, one is transient. And when I saw this tweet, and I saw he was asking linguists, I knew that we were going to win because they, you know, he's asking the wrong people, right? He should be asking computer scientists because we have the math and the logic to answer this question. So I will teach you in the next three minutes CTL very, very briefly, okay? 
So this is a way of looking at the world. That little graph up top, that top node is the present, and the little nodes that connect to it are the future, right? And so these are possible, multiple different possible futures. So this is the next step in time. You know, that was today, and that's tomorrow. And that is one possible tomorrow. This is every possible tomorrow, and the day after, and every future after that. This is one possible path through the future. This is one possible state in every possible future. So I'm not gonna teach you the whole thing, but I'm gonna point out that the mathematicians who developed this system have come up with precise terminology to talk about the kinds of things that lawyers talk about all the time. And they try to nail down with precision in their contracts these kinds of future states. And now that we have this language to talk about the future in a precise way, we have what we need to answer his questions exactly, right? So ACME shall keep the information confidential in every possible future, right? Which one of these is that? In every possible future, in every possible state, every path, you want it to be blue, right? So that would be an AG. As opposed to ACME shall pay the purchase price at some point, but not possibly not on the same day in every possible future, but having paid the purchase price, you don't need to pay it again, right? So which of these is that? Mm. Did I hear anyone say AF? So AF is that payment, right? That happens in every possible future, but it happens once. And so that gives us the language that we need to answer his question and to write these contracts in a way that is much more foolproof and much more sound than sort of futzing around with, with informal English. Can you say the purchase that would have helped you out? Uh, this, well, this whole, the language that we will use to describe these things, this, this language of AF or AG or AX, that is LTL, CTL language. Uh huh. I was saying he's asking the wrong people, because you know, if you ask the linguists, that's right. Yeah, because if you're a linguist, you're answering this question. You're like, oh, you know, that's a a, a predicative, perfective, present progressive tense, right? Right. Now LTL is linear temporal logic and CTL's computational tree logic, and these two things go together, and they look like this. This is LTL, CTL, right? It's a family of, of languages. And this gives us the, what we need to do automated bug finding, right? Automated bug finding in the context of contracts is really useful because this is what, this is what happens in negotiation, right? Lawyers disagree about what does this word actually mean? Is this the right way to describe something? Now we have a way for computers to answer these questions by doing a thing called model checking. So model checking is another type of formal verification. This was work that was done about 10 years ago where you take some existing contract, and here we have a service level agreement between an ISP and a client, and you take that contract and you go line by line and you translate that into the kinds of formalism that we just looked at. This is a slightly different version, but the idea is the same, you say, you must do this, and then we're going to turn it into AF or AG, little boxes and math symbols, but the end of this process is the semantics of your contract have been translated into something that a computer can read and reason with, and you can take this to a computer and you can say, check my reasoning, are there any loopholes, are there any bugs in this contract? And the computer will then say, why, yes, in fact, this is what your contract looks like as a graph, and this is a transition within your graph that is allowed by the contract, but that you didn't want to happen. And it gives you a specific counterexample. It gives you a, a trace that says, here is how you get to this failure state, and this is why it's a failure state, and if you want to fix it, you have to go modify this particular clause in your contract. And this begins to look like the kind of thing that 
you have to pay fairly experienced lawyers a lot of money to think about in the shower, right? Only you can push this through a machine, and the machine will do it in about three minutes. So all that was great. You know, that's a 50-year tradition of research, and it was all ignored in 2008 when Satoshi Nakamoto came along with Bitcoin and blew everybody's mind because for the first time in history, it became possible to transfer money uh, in a way that nobody could prevent. Um, shortly after Bitcoin came out, Ethereum came out, and Ethereum made it possible for you to run code in the blockchain and thereby build unstoppable applications, which turned out to sound like a really good idea in theory, but in practice, if your code had a bug and a huge amount of money was riding on that code and was exposed to that bug, then people started saying, oh, well, maybe we do need a way to uh, stop those unstoppable applications after all. And so that was embarrassing. And that pointed to the absence of what we call governance. And so computer scientists you know, are adorable because they think that the problems that face have never been faced by anyone ever before. And lawyers will say, well, actually, disputes and uh, dispute resolution has been around for a very long time. And what you need is a governance mechanism to resolve these things. Um, it, it is possible to uh, identify a whole list of ways that you could hack an Ethereum smart contract and make off with $60 million. So if you want to get rich quick and don't want to do your own ICO, you could just steal somebody else's. So that led to the formal verification of Ethereum smart contracts. There's active work going on in that domain today. People have been thinking about how to use various techniques like type-driven development. If you're a Haskell programmer or an OCaml programmer, you will feel vindicated at this moment because this is how things should be done. This is how programs should be written. It should not be JavaScript. It should be Haskell. Um, there are whole startups that are coming up around the idea of doing formal verification of Ethereum smart contracts. Um, there are other people working in the space of defining their own contract languages. These guys, Adjoint, have gone and defined their own language, their own blockchain, their own system that is not Ethereum, but something like it. And they're going around and selling this to people who want private blockchains. And they have written a bunch of code to do contracts without Ethereum. Uh, they're not the only players. Uh, Tezos came along and developed a stack-based smart contract language called Mickelson. And they claim that because it is closer to fourth in ML, it'll be easier to do formal verification, and it'll be easier to debug, and there'll be fewer $60 million events. Uh, this got a huge amount of attention and turned into the world's largest ICO at the time, $232 million they raised, and they had no idea what to do with it, so they turned uh, some of it into gold, apparently. <laughs> um, but, but this is the sort of thing that is getting people's attention. Isn't Bitcoin supposed to be the gold replacement? Indeed. Bitcoin is whatever you want it to be. As long as it goes up, we're all happy, right? Um, <laughs> so that takes us to the generation of Bitcoin and Ethereum and things beyond Ethereum. There have been consortia working on bringing banks together to disintermediate things like ISDA and SWIFT. The banks want to do it themselves. They don't see a need for some central coordinating agency like Visa or SWIFT to get in the way of their transactions. Go back two slides. This one, Tezos. Next one. OK. Uh, here we have a some kind of weird aircraft that can both pretend to be a helicopter or a plane. So we're getting to the convergence here. Uh, Open Law is a project. Agrello is another project. They did an ICO. I think they raised some tens of millions to go build legally binding smart contracts. The Internet of Agreements I mentioned earlier. They've got their own white paper, and they've got a vision for how to bring dispute resolution and arbitration back into the world of smart contracts so that if your smart contract goes awry, there will be some kind of judge-like entity able to adjudicate your dispute. So you, should, you can check this out. Koala is another project in this domain trying to find a legal foundation for smart contracts. The Accord project is doing very good work with Hyperledger. They are also trying to merge traditional smart contracts with actual legal contracts. 
a project called Cicero. You can go and read about this if you want. Um, there's a fair amount of work on GitHub already. Uh, these guys presented about a month ago at Stanford. They also have their live contracts platform that merges blockchain with traditional contracts. This is all work that is sort of happening and is very on theme with Codex and computable contracts. So I just want to spend a few minutes before we get into Q&A talking about some of the potential applications of what happens when we have these things up and running. So one idea is GitHub for contracts, right? Today, when you want to get yourself a traditional legal contract, you go off and you email your lawyer friend, and your lawyer friend emails you a Word document, and you don't quite know what to do with it, and you start tweaking it, and after tweaking it a little bit, you feel like you don't really know what you're doing. That feeling is exactly the same as when you open up an executable binary and start twiddling the bits in a hex editor. You don't really feel comfortable editing the binary. What you want to do is edit the source code and recompile that binary, and that is what a GitHub for contracts would allow you to do. There would be contracts available as source code that you could tweak, regenerate English from. So that's one possible future. We've talked about bug finding. We've talked about um, formal verification. An interesting idea going beyond robo lawyers are coming for our jobs is the idea of robo judges, where you could say, what would the judge do? And not just based on a machine learning, deep learning kind of fuzzy match. You could say, well, based on the reasoning, based on the law, based on the past case law, here's what a judge should decide in this case. And if you can get to 99% accuracy on the robo judge, then that could just, you know, I think litigants might just say, you know, we'll just take what the robot says and we'll skip the lawsuit and go straight to the outcome. So that's another thing that could happen. Um, the work that I've been working on in, in the startup called Legalese, which is something that Alexis and I, here's my co-founder, hi Alexis. Uh, we've been working on this for a while. I don't know if you can see this. I might have to turn off the lights. Should I try flipping switches randomly? How about that one? There. Oh, that turned them all on, eh? All right, well, sorry. <laughs> I tried. So this is something that if you're an engineer, if you're a programmer, if you're a Unix person, uh, you'll recognize what we're trying to do here is we're trying to compile a contract, written in our little language, the language is called L4, compile a contract into English and German, and the compiler will tell you, sorry, you've got a bug on line 12 because this clause will never be enforceable. You've got a bug on line 28 because there are incompatible obligations. Line 28 says you have to do one thing. Line 16 says you have to do another. And you can't do both at once. And the computer told you that. You didn't need a lawyer to tell you that. Um, you could even get to things like, you know, the regulation won't allow you to do line 33. So this is a fairly large system. This is a snapshot from the future. We don't actually have this up and running yet, but this is where we are headed. And once the compiler is done, it produces output in English and in German, and it says, here's how you get this thing signed, and this is the sequence. So you want to see L4 real quick? This is, this is what our language looks like. We've been working on this for the last couple of years now. This is our contribution to the, to the programming lexicon. We're contributing the shall keyword. And what happens here is you say, subject to these rules and notwithstanding those rules, when certain conditions occur, this party P shall or shall not perform some action following some set of rules within some deadline. And if you are familiar with contract drafting, you know that most clauses, the sort of the skeleton, the logical structure of a contract clause really does boil down to this kind of structure. We'll take questions at the end. You can disagree if you want. Um, and I think of a contract as a graph of these clauses connected together by the hence and lest constructs. So you say, here's one clause, and if it happens, then it proceeds to this other clause. And if it doesn't happen, then control passes to this other clause. It's kind of like an if-then-else, but it's a shall, hence, and lest. 
because that sounds much more legal and official. And the way I got into this was when I was working with contracts, I was looking at text that looked like this, and my reaction, I had this sort of itch. It felt like a mild allergy coming on. Um, my reaction was, we need to take this thing out of Microsoft Word and put it into Emacs or some kind of text editor, Sublime, Atom, give it some indentation, some curly braces, some syntax highlighting, and that is what that clause really wants to be, right? It wants to be a chunk of the program. And the idea that you can start with that thing on the left and then compile it to the thing on the right, that's called natural language generation. And the idea that you can start with the thing on the right and extract the thing on the left is called natural language processing. And if we can round trip between these two things, then we will have achieved what's called isomorphism. So this is the challenge, right? And if we can achieve this, then we can stop calling contract lawyers copy and paste monkeys, which is what the Law Society Gazette calls them. Natural language generation. NLG is generation, NLP is processing, and one of them is write, one of them is read. So we've been working on this language for a while. This is the latest like, version of it. We're not expecting people to actually write code in this language, um, but these are the bones that lie sort of buried under the sand. What we have done is we have taken the simplest possible contract that we can imagine, which is a, kind of a joke. It's the monster burger challenge, where if you can eat this whole thing in less than 30 minutes, then you get your burger free. Right. Has anybody in the room actually ever done one of these challenges? No? You're all too smart. <laughs> one day, a bucket list, right? Put it down at the end of your bucket list. Um, <laughs> so what we've done is we've taken that contract and we have formalized it in a language that kind of looks like this. We're actually trying a bunch of different approaches to writing this code in a way that an end user could conceivably start to um, tweak or write on their own. So these are different versions of it. I'm not gonna explain this to you. I'm just gonna share this because it, I feel good about the work that we've done and I want someone to see it. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for looking. But this is, this is the kind of thing that, that our formalization looks like. And in the future, it will be possible to compile this stuff, not just to English, but to other languages as well so you can have multilingual contracts that are provably identical in English and Spanish and French and German. Um, and then you can push this into formal verification, you can turn this into a flow chart, you can have diagrams, and you can have the computer do the reasoning. So all of the high level advanced thinking that usually a lawyer would be paid to do, we are now beginning to be able to do in software. And law schools are coming to us and saying, how soon will you be able to teach this to our students because the students want to learn to code, but they don't want to learn to code a web app. They want to learn to code something more relevant to their programming um, or to their, <laughs> to their law school education. And so I like to think of this as the kind of thing that law students will be learning to write maybe 10 years from now, maybe five years from now. A generation of law students are coming up and they already have learned how to program in high school and college. And so doing this kind of thing won't be too scary for them. That's the hope. So we've got about five minutes for questions, uh, five, ten minutes for Q&A if anybody wants to talk about some of these things. Uh, if this side of the room could come up to the mic. Yes, there is a mic here. We have a mic. Yeah. So. Uh, thanks very much. I'm curious uh, how you would uh, handle a, a term like reasonable or reasonableness or unreasonable. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of those hard problems. Um, intentional versus unintentional ambiguity in contracts. How do we deal with terms like reasonable? So if you have a software background, you think in terms of library calls and function calls and exception handling. And the whole point of the formal verification work that I just showed you was that you would in theory, be able to bring forward the kinds of bugs that you find at runtime and detect those bugs at compile time, right? Compile time, runtime. And we want to use static analysis tools to detect bugs at compile time so that we can avoid 
running into these bugs at runtime. Because finding a bug in a contract at runtime is called litigation. It's very expensive. Now, what does that have to do with things like reasonable, right? When you find a bug at runtime, your exception handler is ultimately a human. And that human is a judge or an arbitrator, right? But we see that as a function call from the domain of the contract into the domain of humans. And whether something is reasonable or not, that itself is a function call, right? You run a function call saying, is this reasonable? And you might have to ask a human, or you might be able to answer that question in an automated way. But basically, anytime you see reasonable efforts or reasonable um, practice, that gets flagged as a potential function call out to a human. And you could say, every time this particular action is taken, we say, here's the trace of that action, and we'll expose that trace to a human API and ask the human, was that reasonable, yes or no? And that human doesn't have to be the judge. It could be the expert witness type person, or it could be somebody that both parties have agreed ahead of time will be the, the decider. Um, but we think of it in terms of the human API, Mechanical Turk, and exception handling. Did that completely lose everybody? Are you all asleep now? Any other questions? It's more of a like a sort of a gesture in the direction of what we're thinking rather than a specific answer. Would you want to use the mic right next to you, please? Um, is blockchain disrupting for this concept? Is blockchain disrupting? So people are saying, so let's look at the pure blockchain maximalist idea of what smart contracts do, right? Smart contracts should allow you to Ooh, I have stuff on my screen. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I wonder if I could clear it. Uh, maybe not. Um, so there are so there are some countries which are exploring the idea of using um, blockchain for their land registries, which suggests that you can then do your conveyancing online. People are now writing contracts that say, if this much money shows up in this location, then we will do an API call to the land registry and say, this is the new owner, right? That's the kind of thing that could disrupt an existing conveyancing lawyer practice because the parties will transact directly and they don't need somebody to drive up in their flashy BMW and give you like 50 pages to sign in half an hour and then drive off. Right, because that BMW is a clue that they are getting paid too much and need to be disrupted. Thanks. Yes, uh, question from we, online. We have an online question here from Kirk Johnson who asks, uh, do you have any suggestions for reading about CTL and LTL? The additional formalism past standard Boolean logic looked like it formalized some interesting concepts. Uh, gosh, well, I will make this page, uh, I'll make this presentation available, and there's a page in here that shows you some of the resources on model checking contracts. So that could be a good place to start. It's also Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will put this on the Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is Meng Wong, M-E-N-G-W-O-N-G. -E -E so instead of looking for that right now, I'll just, I'll just show you my out there, that's, okay, any other thoughts, comments, questions? You had a discussion, you had a question earlier about how does this, what does this mean for regulatory enforcement of proposed Mergers, like that was, that was one thing you were thinking about. Do you want to come in and use the mic, or shall I walk the mic up to you? I sort of answered it. Okay. 
Okay. So yeah. So the way. So she said, you know, I have kind of answered that question. But again, when as a practicing programmer, right? When I hear about the kinds of problems that you deal with in business and in law, being both naive and ignorant, and possibly overambitious, I think about how programmers think about these questions, and wanting to do, wanting to set up an acquisition for your company while your company simultaneously goes off and acquires some other company, sounds like the kind of challenge that's kind of like getting your Google Drive and your Dropbox to sync the same set of files, right? And you need to, you need to set things up in a fairly specific way, but once you set it up, it does work. But if you don't set it up right, you run into the kinds of problems that you get when you screw up your Dropbox and your Google Drive. So that's the kind of thinking at a high level that we are trying to bring to law. And that's what we're doing at Codex. So no further questions. Oh, three questions now. OK, <laughs> well, I just must have said something that you We'll, we'll take with. maybe two more minutes, okay, and okay. then we'll. I don't yeah. think you've been heard from yet. So do you want to walk that mic over, or we could? Uh, the language. I, I would, if it well, works. It's, it's okay if we don't need that. Okay. Well, what was your question about language? Okay. So, uh, you know, it's it's great to be able to take the law and break it out and and put it into your language. But it says in there like, if such and such happens, then do this basically. Mm -hmm. But how do you ever find that such and such? Because the way that's worded or the concepts of the words that are used are actually not never. They're never going to be the same. Yeah, so the, this is the control structure for contracts in general. Um, the specific contract will depend on the domain. It could be investment agreements, it could be conveyancing, it could be monster burgers and restaurants. And that's where ontologies come in. The ontologies are how you fill in those particular blanks, saying the food can be eaten or unfinished, or in the case of this one challenge we found, if you puke, you don't get to claim it as finished. Um, and you can specify different kinds of burgers. You can have cheeseburgers or pickles on them. All of this stuff needs to be defined by the domain expert. The good news is it only needs to be defined once. And subsequently, you can just use that structure. So it's not easy. It takes a bunch of work. I predict law students will be doing a huge amount of this work over the next few years. But that's, that's how it goes. Uh, one last comment. I think you didn't. Let's use Thanks. That. This is great and fascinating. I'm curious how you articulate with the most sophisticated natural language processing softwares out there, for example, Google Neural Machine Translation, the logic of contracts as translated from text to um, code um, would seem to be uh, fully articulatable with something like GNMT and that that would offer the logic of language um, per your text side of that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there are. My internet is down, but oh, so there are tools that we are using. One of them is GF, Grammatical Framework, which is a programming language for multilingual grammar applications. And if you build the abstract grammar in GF, you can then push out a concrete uh, expression in multiple languages. So these are some of the tools that we're building on, but we are doing a fair amount of um, original work. So there are also projects called well, this is one project, Let's Predict. They are open sourcing their contract analytics software. So this is a very exciting time. We're building on these things, and hopefully we'll have something useful soon. All right. Very good. Well, let's thank May. Great talk, as always. I've heard it about three or four times now, and I always love it. So thank you. Um, so now we're going to have uh, Tony and uh, Kusha join us uh, to talk a little bit about the new Codex blockchain group. Can I use your laptop? Oh, use my laptop. Yeah. Oh, we've got Here. some Matt. odd scribbling. Here. Here. Um, can everyone hear me okay without the mic? Great. Okay, so thanks again, Meng, for setting this up. So my name's Tony Lai. I'm a fellow here at Codex uh, for the last six years. Uh, I did the LLM 
back in 2011 uh, in North Sanctuary Technology. I uh, was a lawyer for five years before that. Uh, Ku Shear is also a Codex Fellow. He uh, comes much more from the technical and business side and uh, is a serial entrepreneur, has had several successful exits. Um, we're here to talk about um, the new Codex blockchain group. So we, we, we pulled this together off the back of a, um, a very long and storied history here at Codex around computational law. But um, in particular, w one of the reasons was that we wanted to bring together the various folks from across the university, from a, you'd rather be use this, okay, from across the university and from, frankly, across the, the whole Silicon Valley ecosystem. There's a lot of um, uh, interest in the, in, in the space, and we see blockchain technologies generally as being a subset of computational law. Um, uh, Meng's already given a, 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 really, a really good sort of theoretical framework, but there are, uh, there are a lot of practical use cases coming out. Um, we're getting a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, it's, an, it's frankly a new way of building out networks that may be much more capital efficient, that gets access to potentially individuals, as well as hedge fund money, as well as like the conventional VC money. So we're seeing here in Silicon Valley in particular a lot of seed stage companies looking at using blockchains and, 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 and token ecosystems to, to, to help with their growth. Um, but this big issue that Meng talked about, um, there's a massive dearth of governance. There's a massive uh, potentially lack of understanding around uh, the role that governance can play in, in actually enabling the full impact for these ecosystems. And so that's an important role, we believe, for, for Codex to play and the Codex community as a whole. So um, that's a little on the why. Um, I mean, uh, again, it's, it's building off existing Codex research. We, we do have a really strong background in both research and as a community in terms of the, the computational law side. But we also want to see how these different technologies can be brought in for the, for the Codex and the broader Stanford community as a whole. So um, uh, a lot of this is using uh, our, our position here as a neutral platform to bring together uh, folks who are looking to understand more and, and for us to be able to influence some of the industry groups that are developing. And uh, we've, we've uh, set out a mandate uh, uh, for ourselves to work with various PhD students who have reached out to us thus far already um, to help them uh, with their research, plug them into folks uh, here within the, the legal ecosystem uh, to the extent they're looking for that. Um, and then uh, we've also had various regulators uh, reach out to us. Uh, uh, personally, in my, 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 own, um, my own work as uh, founding a legal technology company, we've been advising uh, several uh, uh, early stage uh, blockchain uh, uh, development uh, companies and uh, uh, they are by and large, looking to be compliant. They're looking to understand regulation in this space, but regulators themselves are, are also looking to uh, uh, be educated and understand more about this, and there is a lot of potential regulatory arbitrage under uh, underway. So helping that regulation develop as a whole uh, and, and, and having Codex as a, uh, as a convener for that is a, is a big part of what we're, what we're trying to do as well. Um, our initial focus is going to be around helping to uh, look at some of the developing best practices and ethical standards for uh, these token launches, these initial coin offerings. Um, look at the legal issues that are that are coming out from uh, from from these ecosystems, and 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 also look at uh, some of these tactical, practical implementations where you've got folks who are drafting up smart contracts and they're looking for ways in which they can formally verify them. So a lot of the work that Meng's been talking about, we're, we'll be looking to bring that into this community here and uh, present it. We're going to be having uh, a regular 2 p.m. meeting uh, at Codex here. Um, it's going to be uh, accessible remotely as well as uh, in line with our normal Codex meetings, but we're going to be uh, starting this as of next Thursday. Um, Having uh, various folks from across the university, as well as uh, uh, folks who have been reaching out, wanting to present and seek, uh, in particular, some of the, the legal understanding around their blockchain ecosystems. Uh, and we have a pop-up class that we're, we're pulling together. Uh, uh, around the end of January, early February, it's, uh, it's going to be an informal class, but we're going to, again, be making that, uh, that open, but hosting that here um, at Codex. Uh, we have various panels and workshops that people have been reaching out to us to help uh, help arrange, uh, including folks uh, at uh, various large interoperability standards uh, bodies. Uh, they they themselves are seeing their business and technical teams, uh, in a sense, racing far ahead of their legal teams in terms of the development of uh, uh, blockchain uh, deployments, and they're hoping uh, to again use Codex as a, a neutral base to help present educational materials for their in-house in and outside counsel as well. Um, and then finally, we're, we're going to be convening various community partners as part of this initiative. So um, 
Krish, I, I don't know if you wanted to say anything more. Uh, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're just looking and reaching out to folks to, to, to get involved at this stage, uh, whether you're a researcher, uh, you're uh, uh, implementing a blockchain ecosystem, uh, you're a regulator uh, here in the US or elsewhere around the world. Uh, we're looking to convene this as, and, and use Codex as the, the community platform that it is. Um, so uh, please get involved and get in touch. Thanks a lot. Any, any questions? Uh, well, wow. Um, if there's no questions, Kusha and Tony will be around for a little while. Folks want to get them afterwards. Um, and uh, well, thanks everybody uh, for joining us. And I hope you uh, have a good rest of the quarter. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>